So I just wanted to welcome you all um, to our Beavers and Brews San Pedro River event. Um, <clears throat> thank you for uh, coming today. So um, we are Watershed Management Group. So just a little bit of introduction um, to who we are. Watershed Management Group is a nonprofit organization based here in Tucson. Um, and our mission is to develop community-based solutions to ensure uh, long-term prosperity of people and the health of our environment. Let me just share my screen too. Can you all see that? Thumbs up, great, thank you guys. Um, <clears throat> and this is one of our River Run Network events. Uh, so one of the things that we wanna do today with you all is uh, we wanna know how long you've been uh, a part of the River Run Network or if you're a part of it um, yet. And so we have a poll question for you that I can launch um, as I'm talking about the River Run Network and um, what it is. So the River Run Network is a program within Watershed Management Group. Um, and it's a group of people working together to restore Tucson heritage of flowing creeks and rivers. Um, Watershed Management Group organizes activities for members, including creek walks. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I have some photos of that as well. Lisa, you are welcome to jump in. Um, you are you can unmute yourself. So. Hi, everyone. Welcome today. Thanks, Lauren, for helping get the introduction started. Uh, we just wanted to share a few quick slides of what are the activities that are offered through the River Run Network. And it seems, seems like we have a mix of folks um, who are have been involved for a while and who are newer to the River Run Network. Um, <clears throat> so, Looks like we have five folks on already who are, this is their first River Run Network event, welcome. So we have a uh, email bulletin that goes out every two weeks or so and that shares all the upcoming activities. So please keep an eye out on uh, for that and all the activities we have coming up. Um, we have adapted a lot of our activities over the last year because of COVID and it's been much more difficult to get together in groups as we normally would love to do. Um, but we did recently restart our creek walks. And this has been a staple of the River Run Network, getting out to places across the Tucson Basin to see these really amazing spots, uh, riparian areas that have flow, um, some places seasonally, um, there are some places with year-round flow and then also just the hidden gems in our different neighborhoods across town. Um, you can see in the top left, we've got a photo of the recent creek walk down on uh, the San Pedro, but we've, we've started these up again with small groups and social distancing and masks on. So you will see those advertised. Um, so keep an eye out. Unfortunately, we are having to keep them limited to just 10 people. Um, but uh, that is an offering we started up again. If you want to go to the next slide. We also have the Community Science Flow 365 program, which Lauren oversees. And uh, we have a photo here of Sarah Bertelin and her daughter who are Flow 365 members. Uh, this is a great way to get out regularly into your local creek, river, or arroyo and see what's happening there. We have 50 points around town that we are monitoring flow. And this has been critical because this data has not ever really been collected. As we've been trying to figure out how to restore these systems, we want to better understand what's happening at different points of the watershed. So if you join this program, you can get out and monitor regularly um, if it's snow flow or low flow or high flow. Um, and depending on where you're monitoring, you're gonna see all sorts of different things. So this spot right here is a spot where we started to see flow return along the Tango Verde Creek. We have also been doing a lot of cleanups along our creeks and rivers, also in our neighborhoods. And uh, we've organized big group activities, but also we're organizing dispersed cleanups. So another photo here with masks, masks on, the reality of today, um, we are organizing days where we're asking you to get out in your own neighborhood. And that could be with your family group or um, your quarantine bubble, whoever it is, or just by yourself, um, but trying to get 
a big group of people out on the same day, but in all sorts of different locations across the watershed. And then we also do restoration workshops. So we have on the ground projects where we're doing restoration to improve these beautiful riparian areas. And um, those we do open to volunteers. So you will see those also posted in the River Run Network Bulletin, um, the Tucson Action Bulletin that we also send out. You'll see some of those opportunities, um, but that's a great way to get out and get involved with on the ground practices such as one rock check dams or removal of invasive species, um, other green infrastructure type projects. I believe that's the last slide there. So happy to see you all here today and uh, can't wait to hear more from our guests, uh, Mike and Steve. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, so before we jump in, I did um, want to just introduce uh, Mike Foster and Steve Merkley um, to us today. So uh, Mike Foster is a volunteer with the Friends of the San Pedro. Uh, Mike's been doing these surveys since the beginning, really since they started, um, and he's seen a lot of changes in the beaver population in the San Pedro River, so we're really excited to have him with us today um, to talk about these beaver surveys and um, what has been changing throughout the years um, and uh, we also have Steve Merkley here with us, who is a professor of biology, ecology, and environmental biology at Cochise College. Um, he and his students have been helping Mike with these surveys for a little over a year now. Um, so we can jump in with uh, Mike to start us off today. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I have been uh, walking the river for quite a while now. And um, I think as I do it, I just feel like I should uh, monitor what's going on, take uh, notes. Uh, I used to share it with uh, Marsha Radke, who is the um, uh, biologist at the Bureau of Land Management, and she just retired. Um, unfortunately, in the last year, they wouldn't let her share any of the data that uh, we had accumulated. And at that point, I thought, it's best to keep it in citizens' hands. I have no problem at all sharing it with the BLM, but um, there was a guy, I think it was Henry Breen, that was doing an article and he couldn't interview Marcia. So he uh, interviewed me and a few other people who have been out on the river. So I, I like to make sure that we have uh, the information, not just the BLM. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the beaver survey isn't the only opportunity to get out on the San Pedro and to walk from one end to the other. We go from the border at uh, south of Palominos, the U.S.-Mexican border, and walk all the way up to St. David. And each year there's a wet dry that's performed by the uh, Bureau of Land Management, by um, uh, the, the Nature Conservancy, and you can uh, join in that. That's in June each year. And uh, one year I did my own uh, survey where I walked from the border to St. David. It's 45 miles. I heard one of our county commissioners um, comment on a uh, Sunday morning uh, broadcast that the, there is no problem with the San Pedro River. There's plenty of water for 300 years. And I thought, well, how the heck does he know that? So I walked in June the whole length and took video every 100 yards. And I have that video if anybody ever wants to see exactly what the San Pedro River really looks like, and it is something that we need to uh, have concern about. When the uh, Nature Conservancy does their research, uh, their their surveys, uh, it it looks better on paper than it actually does when you look at it on a video camera. So, if anybody ever needs that, please get a get a hold of me. Uh, you're always welcome to contact me for any of the the data that we have, um, any of the videos, or to take a hike. I can be persuaded to go out and you know even sleep out by a beaver dam. Uh, the beaver are pretty much nocturnal and so uh, a lot of times they'll get out there at dusk and they come out just when it's too dark to get a picture of them. But in the morning they stay out a little bit after the light comes up so the morning is the best time to get out there. Of course we've been having temperatures down around 18 degrees along the river. Um, 
So my creative uh, efforts are mostly in doing videos. Uh, and I would be really happy if somebody would take over doing some of the data collection that I've been doing. And, you know, thank goodness that uh, Steve has had an interest in that and his students. And I'm really happy that they're doing that because I do it. I've done it in the past just because other people wouldn't do it. Um, and, it, you know, if somebody else do, does take over more of an organizing um, uh, position in this, I, I'm really happy. Like if uh, you guys want to do it. Yeah, I'm delighted because it's it's a little bit difficult. Like I said, I like to do the I like to do the videos, and I'm always happy to go along on these and go with people because I know the river so well. So please include me. Um, so so the, some people had asked me why do we do the um, survey at a certain time of year, and the river dries out after the monsoon uh, season, uh, which usually ends in around. Uh, around September, uh, the river starts to dry out because the cottonwoods are online. They have green leaves and they're sucking out the uh, water from the river. Um, that is a, a beneficial thing actually to have the, the green vegetation there to uh, control how, um, how you know, the, the shade on the river and how water can re-enter, all the organic material can re-enter the aquifer. But um, they dry the river out not long after September. And uh, so it's a good time to walk once the leaves start to fall in October. Uh, well, no, I mean in, in November, early November, uh, ju but just before that, when the leaves are starting to get a little bit dry, the river starts creeping back. And so ideally you wanna walk down the river when it's dry, just cause it's so much easier. And then the areas that you find that are wet are the areas where the beaver are likely to be because they're not going to go out and hang around in areas where the river dries up for many months of the year. So the wet areas that remain um, in, in, at the time when we do the, the survey in November are the areas where you're most likely to find them. So you can, you know, walk, walk for a couple miles and uh, over dry land and you don't have to pay too close of attention. But when you get to a wet area, then you, you do want to pay some uh, good attention. Um, also, the rattlesnakes are a little less active at that time of year. Once the nighttime temperatures start getting down below 38 degrees, uh, one of the rattle, rattle, rattlesnake researchers on the river says that the uh, rattlesnakes aren't out as much. Um, so I, I don't like uh, running into rattlesnakes. It's always alarming for me. So uh, that's another reason why I like to do it. And starting in late October and going through November into the uh, end of the year and maybe a little bit into January. Uh, another problem is, is that when you have floods coming through, uh, it washes out all the evidence. And some years, uh, not this year, but some years, like last year, we had uh, rains that came in uh, late November. And so luckily we had gotten a lot of the survey done before then, um, but a lot was washed out after that point. So to get an accurate survey, it's good to get as much of it done in a short period of time. So maybe next year we can try to do that, maybe try to get it all done within three weeks or so, depending on how much uh, help we have to avoid the problem of the flood washing away evidence. Um, some years the river is completely wet and it makes, makes doing the survey so much longer because you have to wade through the water. Uh, when it's dry, it's almost like walking down a highway and the stretch from Palominas to the border is extremely easy to do. Um, yeah, and this year, and I'll show you, show you some slides here in a minute, that uh, I started October 20th and ended uh, January 2nd. Hopefully we can improve that. Uh, I walk from south to north because the floods bend the vegetation that way. And when you get into bushwhacking, when there's uh, water and you can't walk down the uh, middle of the river, you're walking against the vegetation all pointing at you and you get snagged by bushes much more easier than when you're going the way that the water bent the vegetation. Uh, when the river is wet, it takes about twice as long to, to walk down than when it's dry. Um, and it's, as I said, when it's dry, it's much easier to look for sign because the beaver don't build where it's dry, where it dries out for several months. So can we go to the next uh, slide? Uh, so I also wear bright colors uh, because there's a hunting season in there and I don't always go in and look and find out when it is, but I know that there are hunting seasons from time to time and they change uh, from year to year to, based on how much uh, population of deer there are. So I usually like to wear something bright. 
Uh, and you can walk below the high water line. So when you're worried about going through private property um, and somebody ever gives you trouble, which we've, I don't think we've ever had, you just tell them, well, I'm below the, um, the high water mark and I have the right to come through here and we're doing a beaver survey. But we haven't had those problems and there, there aren't many private areas um, in the survey area. So next slide. So uh, this year, this is what uh, I ended up doing and you, you guys helped and you guys were great help, by the way. I really liked the group that came down. You guys were very helpful and more observant than me. I, I hate to admit that, but um, your group picked up things that I didn't pick up. And I think part of it is it's, it's just nice to have uh, when I go out by myself, I can't be on both sides of the river. And then you're kind of doing so much, you just don't see as much when you have like uh, four or five people, um, you have that just that many more uh, pairs of eyes and, and you see more. So I really enjoyed your help. And uh, for safety reasons, it's better too. But so that first uh, section you can see was from Palominas to the border. And then uh, the this year we did 12 different um, uh, surveys and, I, and you can see some of them were very long and some of them were very short and I'll get into that. So let's go to the first, the next slide. This uh, shows how we broke it down and I was keeping track of it. I used a little um, uh, Macintosh program where I you know, freeze the screen and then I take it into, um, what is it, preview and you can edit your screen. So I was keeping track of, you know, what areas were done and what areas needed to be done. So this is when we were most of the way done. And can we go to the next screen? <clears throat> so starting down in Palominos, um, since they've been building the border wall, there's a good road that goes, as you can see it, it's in blue. You can take that road right down to the border and then drive right along the, bo the border wall and go to the head of the river. I was just down there the other day and all construction is halted. And believe it or not, I ran into five tourists down there, which, and usually I never see anybody down there. Uh, so uh, it's only four miles if you walk back, uh, if you drive in there and then have somebody drop you off and walk back. And you can probably do that in, in three hours easily. And, and this, this is usually a dry stretch. So it's very easy walking when I was just down there the other day. Um, it was mostly dry, so I got down and back within six hours. What I normally do is I don't drive down because I do it by myself. So I started at Palomitas, walked to the border and walked back. And I think I did the whole thing in six miles, a real easy stretch if somebody wants to, you know, get their, their, their feet wet uh, working on one of these surveys. That's a real easy, fun stretch to do. Can we go to the next? And uh, I didn't find any beaver sign at all. And in previous years, I, there were a lot of beaver in there. It's just in the last uh, several years, we've been going through a really dry spell. Um, after the cut, cottonwood shut down, the river would creep back and go the whole length. But this year so far, it hasn't happened and we're already into February. February. So uh, next slide. Yeah, and this is one spot along the river where you'll find water. Uh, if you go there today, you'll find water there, and that's the most likely area where you're going to find uh, beaver, if there are any beaver. And so uh, maybe Steve and I will work on this. We haven't talked about it much, but uh, we'll, we'll probably find a frequency of where the beaver are. And this is one of those spots, and we have the GPS there. So next slide. So this is a stretch that um, you guys helped us with. And we broke it into two segments, but you could easily break, uh, turn it into one segment, uh, have people um, drive along the blue lines down to Palominos and walk north like we always do. And it's only four, uh, four miles, so that wouldn't take too long. And maybe next year we'll turn that into, you know, a, um, a, a walk that, um, you know, is the whole length uh, because the first section was pretty dry. The second section uh, was wet and took more time. And you generally do find a lot of beaver uh, sign in the, in the other section, the, the uh, top, the north section. Uh, next slide. So uh, in that north section, this is where we normally always find the beaver. So, you know, we know where to really pay uh, close attention. Uh, next slide. And then here's the worst area. And this is where I really like people to help me because, and, and Steve and Frank uh, helped me out this year. 
and uh, you know maybe Steve can say something about how unpleasant it was. <laughs> we had we had a good time, but in places the uh, the wa the grass is over your heads, and there there are some uh, really significant log jams in there, and so you can see like we broke it into three segments, and uh, one took most of the day to do. So next slide. There's an example of one of the log jams and you're tiptoeing over that because you see there's tall grass on the sides and uh, then the logs, uh, you, you just want to stay on the logs if you can, which is difficult. Uh, next slide. And here's Frank, can you see Frank down there? That gives you an example of <laughs> how the uh, grass is, is over your head. And uh, so there were three of us and it, it was really nice to have uh, three of us and we went really slow, but we did find really good beaver in there. And maybe one of the reasons is it's just so hard to get in there. Next slide. Uh, so, yeah, and this is uh, some of the stuff we found in that uh, a stretch just north, the north stretch up there. And, you know, I just found a chewed stick. So I put that down. This is how I make my maps. Everybody can make your maps though the way you want. And then, you know, we can share data. And luckily, uh, Steve put the data together this year, which I, was a huge help. You know, thank goodness he did that because I um, <laughs> I don't enjoy doing that. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then one of the things I want to point out is you can, there's a railroad there in, in red. And then in blue, there's a, an old road. So in some of these stretches, after you get done, if you walk in, and you have to come back. You don't have to go along the river. You can jump on that railroad bed or on the Delay Road and uh, walk back and save yourself a lot of problems. As, as a matter of fact, when I went with Steve and Frank, we took our mountain bikes and uh, 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 drove in the road or mountain bikes back. Next slide. Uh, so then here is kind of a recap of the areas we were just at. And uh, next slide. So then Steve, this is the, uh, the longest one. Steve and I did it. And we had somebody uh, pick us up at the end of the day, but we took the blue route and came in on Miller Wash and then walked back to Hunter Wash and then walked up to the San Pedro house. And that was 13 miles. I think we started at 8.30. And uh, then somebody picked us up and by the end of the day, we got back to our cars and got out of there. But uh, it was doable and uh, we had a good time out there and we did find some, uh, some evidence out there. Next slide. And then this was a group, um, uh, this, was, this is a section that's north of Highway 90. And uh, Steve did that uh, segment uh, in his group from with you guys did uh, segment seven through eight. And then I did the um, eight through nine. And uh, Steve and his group found a couple and maybe three. Uh, I think there were like two and then another one. He can talk more about that later. So there's another stretch and let's go on to the next slide. And then north of there, um, you can, oh no, this is, this is the same thing. And let's go to the next slide. So then this was an easy stretch to do. It's a really nice walk. It's about um, eight miles. I did that one by myself. I'm really familiar with that stretch of the river and the walking is relatively easy. Uh, if people wanna see a really beautiful area of the river, that's a good place to go. And next slide. So then the next one is from Fairbank North and that was mostly dry. Uh, and that was very easy going. And then there was one stretch north of there that, uh, that I didn't do because it's, uh, it rarely has water in it. Uh, but that's just a recap of uh, what we did this year. And if anybody has questions now or later on and they wanna ask me about it, uh, they can, but I just thought I would go over the different um, segments of the river and that, you know, why some of them take a lot longer and why some are so much more difficult than others. It has to do with water and vegetation, log jams, things like that. So I'll turn it over to Lauren. I don't know if we take questions now or if those are later. 
Yeah, we'll have a time for Q and A. There are some people that are putting questions in the chat, which is great. So, if I miss your question during the Q and A, just um, speak up and, and let us know. But I think we're going to jump to Steve. Okay. Can you stop your screen share and I'll share mine, and then I'll come back to these these photos. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. This is basically a collation of the data that we've collected over the past couple years. This beaver mo these beaver monitoring uh, surveys have been done for a while before uh, with Mike in coordination with the BLM. And in previous th years, there's been a lot more dams and a lot more evidence, but I'll kind of show you where we're at now. So um, I have this, and Mike just talked about all these stretches. So here is, I'll show you from 2019. Um, we didn't uh, collect the data as extensively uh, then. I came out with a group in February, right before the COVID lockdown. And um, we didn't find any evidence because there was a giant flood event that happened in November and washed everything out, as Mike already mentioned. Um, but this map is uh, interactive. So um, each of these represents a dam that was found that year. So you can click on it and then see the photo of the dam. These were both taken, these are all taken by Mike um, on that stretch. Here's another one. This one is actually, a, um, came in from a little side wash and we went there this year and there was no dam there. Um, and there wasn't much water on that stretch either. Um, and then this dam, which uh, we think is, there's still evidence of it being there, although not quite as extensive this past year. Um, so I'll show you that in just a second. So you can see the stretches which there were um, dams and beaver activity in previous years. So I'll move on to 2020 and just briefly recap. I'm not gonna click every single photo, um, but I can share this with you guys. You can see the different evidences of sign, fresh herbivory, old bank lodges, which are essentially um, where the beaver dig a hole in the side of the river. Um, that's where they spend the winter and breed and uh, stay away from predators. And usually the entrance is below the water line so they can go in and then they go up onto land. Um, and I also have some evidence of bank lodge vent holes. These are on the surface. Uh, when you're walking along the river, you see a little area where they have some aeration for their bank lodges. And then a few places, well, there's actually another one that I need to add of caches where they store um, food. So all the stuff in gray is old evidence. So you can see where beavers used to be down in Palominas. We have evidence of old bank lodges uh, that Mike took photos of this year. Um, and then this is the stretch that you guys, you and Mike did together. And there was an old bank lodge here, as well as some fresh herbivory. And this is where he estimated that there was a couple of beaver, although we didn't find any dam, you guys didn't find any dams in that area, but you can see the gnawing that they do on these trees. They have to keep their teeth sharp. They're continuously growing incisors. So they've got to chew on something, um, even if they're not actively building a dam. Um, and they use the sort of the cambium layer underneath to uh, for nutrition. Um, as you move up along the river, this is the really productive section that um, was also the most difficult, as Mike mentioned, to walk through. Um, it took us quite a while, not only because it was difficult to walk through, but we kept finding evidence and taking pictures of things. Um, so we started finding stuff here of, you know, uh, little, little uh, bushes that had been completely gnawed off, for example, um, and taken away. And then as you move up, more and more activity until finally we hit this dam here. And actually, I think I have this one as my background today for my Zoom. Um, but you can see that this is a pretty well put together dam. And this was not here in the previous year in 2019. Um, more and more herbivory up here and another dam. And this is fairly close together. These three dams are really close to each other, um, which makes me think that this is a, a beaver colony, a family group. Um, I'll show you some, I'll show you a picture of the cache that we believe was there. Okay, this, I need to rotate this one, but basically they're storing uh, stuff underneath the water here to um, use as food. 
and then the beaver dam, another beaver dam right here. So it's quite exciting to find this after doing all the hard hiking to get there. Um, a lot of times you go out, do these stretches, and you don't really find anything, which is fine because we need the information, but um, you can still enjoy. There's lots of cool things to see on the San Pedro River. The water was quite deep in some of these sections, as you can imagine. There's these basically three beaver dams in succession. Um, so that's why we had to walk through the um, vegetation on the sides. Um, this is an old dam found in a previous year that is, um, you know, still some evidence there, but not really put together. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, the structure is not quite there. Um, okay, as we move up, this is the long stretch that I did with Mike, and you can see it's all old, um, uh, old sign. Most of these are old bank lodges. Um, this is one of these I crawled in or I jumped in the water up to my chest. Uh, Mike has some pictures of me trying to get in there and take pictures inside the bank lodge. Um, just because there is an old bank lodge, there could be beavers in this stretch. We didn't see any fresh herbivory, um, but they still could be using the bank lodges. This is a, an area that historically there's been a lot of beaver and I think um, Hopefully so, this group down here and this other group up here will recolonize as they um, have some offspring. And then this stretch was done by um, myself and the watershed management group. And we also found three beaver dams in this stretch. This one might be a different, um, uh, maybe just a mating pair or a small group. Um, but there, the dam was quite extensive there, as you can see, and there's lots of photos. This is not quite the best view, but you can see it over here. And then the uh, place where we found a lot of activity is up on this area, which is all on private property. So the guy that owns this property is very nice and allowed me to come in and put a... Um, a camera on right next to the dam so I could try to get some evidence of the beavers and what they were doing. So this has actually changed a little bit. There's a second layer now to this dam. Um, there is some photos of the beavers and I'll show you some more later, but there is a pair there at least. And then there's another beaver dam just a little bit to the north um, that is uh, probably part of the same family group as well. Um, and I'll show you this one too. And the property owner, both of these are on his property. So he's actually told me that he put up a camera at this dam as well. There's no tree to attach it to. So he had to put a post in the ground. Um, so hopefully we'll get some data from that as well. And hopefully they'll have some kits here coming up in the, the spring. Um, that was really the active evidence for this year. As you move farther north, uh, there were some old sign and um, Mike mentioned this, some old bank lodges here uh, north of uh, Charleston Road. And I think I need to add some more in here, Mike, that you found old, old sign up here. Um, so that's kind of what I want to do with this each year as we go out and monitor is keep track of how the beaver dams and beaver activity is changing over time. Oh, I did want to show you this because all these little yellow parts are where beaver had chewed. And he had put um, some fencing around some of his trees because he didn't want the beaver to take down all his trees. And he let one of the trees go so the beaver could have it. And they abandoned it and went to the other side of the river and uh, completely took down. Oh, I thought I put the photo in there. I'll have to show that to you later. Maybe if you stick around for the Q&A. But they completely took down a tree and it fell in the water with all the leaves. So there's a cache there as well um, for the beavers. So um, you, let's see, I'll stop my share. You can go back to the PowerPoint. Just let me know where you want me to. Yeah, that's perfect. I'll let you know when to, to switch slides. So yeah, um, I put these up just after Thanksgiving um, and I've gone a couple times to check them. I just went this last week. And as you can see, as Mike said, it gets really cold there at night. This camera has it down at 20 degrees. And I don't have any pictures of them in the day. So it's, everything is 
either after the sun sets or shortly before the sun comes up. You can see 3.55 a.m., 3, you know, 5.40 a.m. Um, these beavers are going around um, building, and this is put right on the dam. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. There's a number of species that are also utilizing, these are all from the same camera that are utilizing this habitat. And that's been shown to be one of the benefits of beavers and beaver dams is that they provide habitat for lots of other animals. Um, so you can see great horn owl, white-tailed deer, obviously, um, perching birds like black Phoebe, um, lots of wetland birds, uh, mallards, gadwells, uh, Wilson snipe, great blue heron using this habitat. I love this picture of this raccoon swimming, as you can see, right next to the dam. Um, and we also saw ringtail there, which is a kind of cool species uh, that comes out occasionally. Um, so lots of cool stuff um, relying on this uh, area. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the beavers that are in Sonora. So I, before I get into that, I can talk a little bit about what I think the population, and I've talked a little bit about this with Mike, what I think the population of beavers is in the U.S., on the U.S. side of the, the border in on the San Pedro. So as he mentioned, the Nat Nature Conservancy does this annual wet dry survey in June, and I looked at the data and they've been doing it since 2007, and there's usually somewhere between 35 to 50 kilometers of wetted river between the border and um, what we call the upper San Pedro, right, which is basically the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. So, but not, some of that is discontinuous, as Mike mentioned. Um, so, um, the whole San Pedro, including the tri tributaries, has anywhere between 50 and the, the, the high year I found was 96 kilometers of wetted river with an average of about 70. Um, and the upper San Pedro around 40 kilometers. And in the literature, they estimate that beaver densities range from about 0.32 per kilometer up to 1.9 per kilometer, um, but may get higher during certain years. And so I estimate that the carrying capacity sort of of the river, the upper San Pedro on the US side, could be anywhere from 11 to 95 beavers, okay? But you would probably put the, you know, sort of a healthy estimate of population if all the usable habitat was taken up, maybe around 50 or 60. That would be my estimate. And in North America, average beaver colony sizes range from anywhere from about three to eight beavers. Um, usually it's around four to five. Um, sometimes six. So it often includes the mating pair, the two kits from the previous year, and then the two kits from that year. And then those, the second year kits will then disperse to other locations, which is why we may find some of this herbivory going on away from the, the dam sites as they may be going out to sort of establish their own uh, colonies. So um, my estimate of the population on the U.S. side of the river is between 12 to 15, um, but it's possible there could be more than that um, that aren't um, actively building dams. There are beavers down in Sonora in Mexico, um, and what I've heard about this, and I still am trying to get more information from the managers down there, is that back in 2008, there was a large flood event and the rivers used that opportunity to swim upstream and into some habitat that are tributaries on the San Pedro, um, including um, Los, an area called Los Fresnos. And you can kind of see that little uh, black dot there. And that's actually like a big pond um, and it's part of a cattle ranch. And so they have somewhere between 12 and 15, they have three or four family groups on, in and around that pond. You can see some of the dams that they've built. Um, there's definitely gotta be some on the San Pedro as well on the Mexico side. Um, but I'm trying to get info about how many there are. They have told me that they have removed um, 12 nuisance beavers. Um, did she disappear? Okay, the PowerPoint went away. Um, they've removed 12 nuisance beavers um, down there in the last you know, three to four years and actually relocated them to a place called Los Ojos, which is in Sonora, it's kind of south, right south where New Mexico and Arizona um, um, split from each other. So um, 
I think there's a lot of work that can be done on understanding not only population in the US, but also on the Mexico side of the border. So that was actually it for my presentation. So she went away at a good time. <laughs> I think she said her computer froze, so she's trying to get back on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But I think we could probably open up while Lauren's getting back on. Um, let me just look. I don't think she's on yet. Um, <clears throat> open it up to questions. Um, Lauren and I have a few slides we're going to share as well, but with her <laughs> disappearing, we're not able to do that. Um, but Steve and Mike, this is such a cool presentation, like really cool to see the in-depth effort and data um, that has been pulled together and to hear the estimate of beavers. So I have a question and then um, if, if you all have a question, you can raise your hand um, or put it in the chat so we can put in a few questions for Steve and Mike. Um, but <clears throat> maybe uh, for Mike, I don't believe you shared this, but uh, what if you could share a little bit about what, what this population means in terms of where the population started and grew to. So the, the beaver reintroduction was about in 2000. Um, so what, what do you think, having been involved in kind of seeing this, the ebb and flow of the population, what do you think this population size means for the beaver population along San Pedro? Well, uh, what was the number, Steve? I think it was like 16 that was released in 1999. And, uh, then the, the populations have fluctuated uh, over those years. And I think once they estimated there was like 135, which I think is a, you know, way higher than actually uh, existed there. But I guess the big point is that the numbers really fluctuate. And uh, the river goes through a lot of changes as you can imagine. And rainfall is maybe the, the biggest, you know, how much water do we have available? when the whole spring is wet, you can build a dam just about anywhere. And in these uh, last uh, several years, it's been so dry that there really aren't many available spots. Um, I remember at one time when we had the, the large counts, then all of a sudden the numbers went down and the river wasn't all that much drier. But to me, I, my, in my imagination, not that I know, but my, in my imagination, I was thinking that the uh, mountain lions were getting uh, hip to the beaver. You know, because uh, you know where the beaver are, you know, you know they've got a distinct smell. Uh, if you just hang out where their bank lodges are, uh, you, can, uh, you can hunt them. And I've found uh, the intestines of beaver uh, laying out on the bank. And supposedly when the mountain lions eat them, they don't eat the intestines. Uh, there are a number of other things that could happen in there. You could have like, uh, you know, disease, uh, like there are quadamundi in the Huachucas and their numbers plummeted. It could have been disease, could have been predation, uh, could be in, in the, with the beavers, it could be uh, water contamination, some kind of pollution, uh, trapping. Uh, unfortunately, there's, you know, there's one guy right where the beaver are the most numerous that seems to blame everything that's gone wrong in his life on the beaver. And uh, he had threatened to shoot them. So uh, the beaver did disappear from there. So. There are a whole variety of things, but I'm really encouraged in this last year that um, the first year Steve and I did it last year was, um, you know, we had some, but we found more evidence this year. It, and so I think they could certainly rebound. You know, if we have, as Steve was saying, from uh, 12 to 15, that's the original number that was uh, introduced. And if we get uh, good enough flows, I could see that number going back up to uh, the high numbers uh, that uh, Steve uh, mentioned earlier. Thanks, Mike. So we'll take a few more questions and uh, I see Lauren's back. So I think we'll, we'll do our slides. Um, <clears throat> there's some good questions coming in here. Um, one question is what is a nuisance beaver? <laughs> uh, I think that term- Yeah, I can, I can speak to that because actually the, the beavers that were reintroduced to the San Pedro were considered nuisance beavers too. So they are basically beavers that are causing some issue on private or public property. So they can back up the water and flood out someone's property that they don't want uh, that to happen. Um, or they can get into irrigation canals and flood those and stop the flow of water. So anything that kind of 
that's they've, those have been trapped out and that's one of the ways to control them is to trap them and rather than kill them which they do still in many parts of the country if they trap a nuisance beaver reintroduce them to somewhere where the beaver are needed um so yep And then there were two questions about um, related to riparian trees and what's kind of the relationship between beavers and a healthy riparian forest. So is have you all seen or are aware of, um, I would say any detrimental um, influence with the beavers are taking down the trees, but is that negatively impacting the riparian forest health or how do you see that working? Uh, I, I don't. Th I don't think so. I mean, I've I've seen areas, and a lot of times they don't get through the bigger trees. And then, believe it or not, even though the cambium, the whole tree is girdled, the whole cambium is gone at the bottom. The trees will persist for a number of years. But uh, there was a, I ran into one of the guys. They have a number of wells along the San Pedro, and um, one guy was out doing the well monitoring, and he said that he uh, checked his well, and it was like a foot up. And he thought, wow, what, you know, there haven't been any rainstorms or anything. And then he went down to the river and there was a, a beaver dam. So a beaver dam can bring up the uh, groundwater level significantly. And then the riparian vegetation can spread out. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people were really worried that, oh my gosh, my goodness, the beaver are going to take down these beautiful trees. And, and I was too, but, you know, I really don't see what I would call a detrimental effect. Um, you know, it seems to kind of even out. And if anything, it, you know, eventually slowing down the river and accumulating more organic material. Uh, you know, if you did a number of photos over the years, you'd probably see some really good uh, beneficial effects. Uh, numbers of trees like the nutleaf hackberry and the, uh, the, um, the Fresnos, what is that called? The, um, the ash, um, those kind of trees. Um, there's the Western soap berry, those kind of trees seem to be creeping in and it be, seems to be coming a little bit more like uh, Sonoida Creek where you have a, a diversity of deciduous trees, but I haven't seen a real big detrimental. And I think that actually, if you looked at it, it would be a beneficial effect. All right, we're gonna get one more question in and then Lauren, if you wanna put up the slides. Um, Sam was asking if there's a greater beaver population closer to the confluence of the Gila River. Are you all aware of the beaver population in that area? Gila River, um, oh, way down there, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> there, there are definitely beavers in Northern Arizona, <clears throat> um, but I also don't know much about it. <laughs> so future beavers and brews, actually we were trying to find a speaker from who's involved in uh, the Verde River in Northern Arizona, because we do know that there are beavers there and there's some conservation work being done. So we will try to track someone down who can share more about that. Uh, I, <laughs> later on, I want to share one thing. Uh, I found a location last fall where you can camp out right next to a beaver dance. And so whenever you guys are ready, I'll show you uh, where that campground is. And uh, you all might want to like a plan a little trip there sometime because I wake up about a half an hour before dawn. If you just walk 50, 50 feet down from your campsite, you can sit on the bank and watch the beaver swim around. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> Camp trip. <laughs> show, show, um, do you want me to show you that now or later? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. So this is... Um, Buffalo Crossing, this is in the White Mountains. So you go up um, north of Morency on Highway um, 191, like you're heading to Alpine, and you might even go into Alpine, and then you go, go down on the Black River. And so I wanted to show you here, can everybody see just all these dams that are in this one little stretch of the river? And um, it makes a really wide area. And as a matter of fact, it's so wide, when I was there, there was a lodge in the middle and you never see it on, this, on the San Pedro. You'll see that on lakes in the north, but uh, not on the San Pedro. So they actually had a lodge in the middle. And so this, this road is a road of the campground. You can camp along it. Um, and it, as you can see, there's another beaver dam here. 
and another one here. And uh, I camped right out here and I just walked down and I saw eight beaver in the morning. Uh, and I filmed them mewing or recorded them mewing. Uh, they make this kind of mm, mm, mm type sound and uh, up further there are more and all along the Black River there are beaver dams. So if you want to get your own pictures, all you got to do is get up before dawn and, and wait and they'll usually hang around a little after the light comes up, take some pictures, just be quiet and don't move and you'll be able to get some great shots. And this is uh, what the campground looks like. Uh, you know, when you're going in there, it's on the Apache sit graves. And if anybody needs uh, better information, just um, you can write to me or just write that name down and um, great place to go see beaver. Right now, I just talked to the Forest Service today about it and the I roads are pretty icy. They say in April, the uh, roads are usually clear enough that you can get down there. So I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> All right, we, uh, Lauren and I have a few slides and then um, we have a short little, I think if it's going to work, a little teaser video for some uh, upcoming beaver related uh, efforts that WMG is working on. Um, and then I think uh, Steve and Mike offered to stay on a little bit past our time. So if, there, if folks wanna stay on for further questions, we'll be able to stay on a little bit longer. Um, but we wanted to uh, update you all on WMG's release, the Beavers campaign. So this is something we started about a year and a half ago um, in relation to the effort to reintroduce beavers into La Cienegas National Conservation Area. So that's in the Santa Cruz watershed, so neighboring to the San Pedro. Um, the Bureau of Land Management has been looking at bringing beavers back into this area. They've already assessed that there's enough water, uh, perennial water to support beavers. And it's kind of been a backburnered project for over a decade, but there was some real movement to push this forward in the last few years. And they started an environmental assessment process. Um, this is what we've been, uh, it feels like forever waiting for at this point, because I think a year and a half ago, we heard six months and it's now a year and a half later and we keep hearing that it is in process. So hard to say exactly what that means. We know with government transitions that probably slowed things down, but um, as far as we know, it's still in, in process. So um, very much still a possibility and we wanna keep the dream alive by keeping talking about it and hopefully keeping it in front of the agencies that the community and the public cares about this. Um, <clears throat> and the introduction itself would be with um, Arizona Game and Fish. So um, <clears throat> uh, WMG's uh, campaign is more around public education awareness and then advocating for this effort. Uh, the, the other part, so a couple other parts of what WMG is working on is just promoting understanding in general around the role of beavers as a keystone species in, in riparian areas in southern Arizona. And um, with the beavers having um, basically been hunted, hunted out back in the early 1800s, uh, a lot of the riparian areas uh, have not really been at their prime state because they've been missing this keystone species. So we were wanting to bring awareness around that and <clears throat> really kind of prepare the community again for uh, seeing beavers as an asset, something that we want to have in our riparian areas. Um, and then finally, um, we've been getting more involved with the San Pedro beavers effort in terms of learning what's going on. Uh, when we did a panel a year and a half ago, we had heard that maybe there weren't any more beavers in the San Pedro, so that was a bit of a shock, but we're happy to hear that there still are some beavers, and that's how we got involved with Mike to learn more about what has been going on with the surveys and what the current population is. So it's wonderful to see that there still are beavers in the San Pedro to learn um, what, that, what has been going on in that watershed and what we can learn from the San Pedro beavers. And then um, what we're also interested in getting more involved in moving forward is advocating for new releases, um, that there is more capacity for beavers in the San Pedro. And, um, you know, if the, the community speaks up about this and uh, we might be able to 
influence the agencies to um, to bring more beavers and to release a new set of beavers and continue making sure that that population is robust. If you want to, yeah, move ahead. So we have a number of um, illustrations of what our vision of a restored Tucson Basin would look like for our creeks and rivers. And so you might have seen this. This is our illustration of Las Cienegas National Conservation Area with the beavers reintroduced. And um, <clears throat> there is, as I mentioned before, already perennial water there. Um, but once you have beavers moving in, you're going to see uh, dams and slowing of the flow to create bigger pools and um, basically a broader floodplain because there's more water, there's more water on the landscape, you're going to actually see um, in some ways the riparian area expand. So they will be taking down some riparian trees, but they'll also, as Mike um, pointed out, um, be expanding the riparian habitat and you're going to see new riparian species moving in. You want to move to the next slide. And this is uh, the actual place. Uh, this is a photo from Las Cienegas um, when we were out there on a field trip two summers ago. So you can see there's lots of good water there and this picture was from June, so the driest time of the year. There's still quite a bit of water. And <clears throat> for those of you who may not be as familiar with uh, Cienega Creek, Cienega Creek does flow into the Pantano, uh, which does feed the Rito, which feeds the Santa Cruz River. So it is an upstream tributary to the Santa Cruz River and is part of our Tucson Basin. All right, uh, Lauren, do you want to talk about this slide about the Triple Crown? Yeah, I can talk about it. So um, the Triple Crown is through the River Run Network program, um, something that uh, we did with our members was challenge them to take action um, in their own, own neighborhoods through COVID-19 um, since no one was really able to get out and we weren't able to do in-person events. We really challenged um, our members to um, do things in their own areas and in their own backyards. And our triple crown was um, kind of the, the prize was helping with this San Pedro Beaver survey. So, um, we had quite a few people um, win the Triple Crown, which you had to participate in three different, uh, we called them take action events to win um, and to be able to come help on uh, this survey. So that is, um, sorry, it's not, some parts of the screen aren't going away, so I can't see the full slide, but um, that um, is, this beaver survey is what, um, the, the winning of the Triple Crown was. So it was just a, a really great opportunity for us to be able to help uh, with the surveys, uh, with uh, help Mike and, and Steve uh, be able to do this. So um, we are hoping, um, as we've said before, to um, continue to help with this and, and gather volunteers. And hopefully uh, this upcoming year, we'll be able to have more people we had um, just the, the three small groups that were able to help this year um, or this past year in, in 2020. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to um, maybe help on each stretch of the river. So uh, looking, looking forward to that for sure. Um, <clears throat> and this next slide is uh, just kind of my experience with uh, the beaver survey uh, from uh, 2020. So um, I was one of the the lucky ones to be able to get to go along. And it was just such a great opportunity and so fun. Um, you can see us walking through um, the, the water. And um, this was one of the dams that Steve had showed us earlier it was in this photo. Um, you can see the, the three of us kind of standing in there. Um, so we just had this a great time and it was just a beautiful area. So yeah, um, let's see. Thanks, Lauren. <clears throat> I threw this photo in. Um, this is one I took. I was in a different group than Lauren for the beaver survey. I also had a fantastic time and learned so much from Mike. So thank you, Mike, for taking us out. Um, we didn't see any beaver dams on our stretch, but we did see um, recent evidence of beaver activity. So that's what I wanted to show this photo from. We, we saw these little chewed pieces of um, 
trees right in the water and um, as the I think the term that Steve and Mike were using is the cache so uh, uh, a bunching of this material that the beavers can um, use and is a good way to kind of find beaver activity. Um, so it was just such a cool opportunity to get on out on the river, it was freezing. <laughs> so those of us who were walking in the river, um, definitely maybe us Tucson city folk aren't quite prepared for having our feet cold for many hours, but um, it was just beautiful to be along that perennial stretch to see what a resource it is in, in Southern Arizona to have this river and to see live evidence of beavers um, along that stretch was so cool. And the next slide. <clears throat> so um, we are going to, we have launched, if you haven't heard yet, our spring 2021 Triple Crown. So we're doing this again. We had so much fun with it. And it's the same idea where we're asking members to get out and participate in our Take Action events. Um, we are offering, uh, we're going to be making a River and Network t-shirt. So this is new. So we want people to be able to be around town wearing their River and Network t-shirt when they're out pulling invasives or picking up trash or building a basin and celebrate the group. So anyone who does a Take Action event and um, sends us a photo and a description, we will give you a t-shirt. And if you do three, then you will win the Triple Crown. And our Triple Crown prize this spring is going to be a special field trip to Las Cienegas National Conservation Area in the area where they are planning to release the beavers. It is a little bit tricky to get out there, um, but uh, we are happy to take folks out there. And so, um, we will be planning that uh, with everyone who has earned the Triple Crown. Um, so keep an eye out for these events. Some of the upcoming, we have BYOB and Plant a Tree coming up in early M March. So that's Build Your Own Basin. We have a, a virtual workshop and we're actually giving out Build Your Own Basin kits for free to anyone who registers. And then we're going to be doing another invasive species uh, poll um, workshop with Trevor and then a take action day. And then we have some more steward your streets and clean your creeks events coming up. I believe this is the teaser video that we have for you all as well. It was not playing on the screen earlier, so I might have to use the link, but we'll see. Lauren, did you do the... Um the, what is it called? Where oh, you yes. um, Share modify, modify for video, enhance video, whatever it's called. I did not. I don't know if I know how to do that. Optimize for video clip. Yes. Got it. All right. Fingers <laughs> crossed, you all. Let's see if this plays. There we go. <laughs> flows very quickly into the Santa Cruz River, up to Abra Valley, diving underground, and then it's gone. They can relocate them down here. We believe that there were beavers in the Santa Cruz watershed gone before people started paying attention. There will be opposition to putting beavers here.
explaining it. There we go. <laughs> well, we, you are the first group to see the, that video. Uh, teaser, it's the, the teaser for the teaser. Um, we, uh, and to see our, to get a little sneak peek that um, Devin is very excited about, International Beaver Day is on April 7th, which is the day after Arizona Gives Day, and WG loves Arizona Gives Day, so we're teaming up these two things to do a big push for Release the Beavers. We're going to have some new short videos. We're working with the filmmaker Marcus de Leon, so that's what that little teaser was for. So any feedback you have for us on the little teaser video, we'd love to hear, um, but you're the first to see it and first to hear. This is a, a big push we're going to be working towards April 6th and 7th. Um, so, thank you so much. I think um, uh, it looks like Steve had to, to leave, but Michael is still here and Lauren and I can stay on for a bit for, for questions. And I know a few more came in the chat. So, Lauren, how would you like to proceed with that? Um, I can, oh, sounds like I'm echoing a little bit. Um, I will read some questions off in the chat and then um, we can start there. Oh goodness. If I miss your question, I apologize. I am scrolling up as far as I can see. I do, 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 do. And thanks everyone. I know people, we're past our time, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, if you have to go, we totally understand, but if you want to stick around for a few, we'll be getting a few more questions in. <clears throat> oh, uh, Sam asked, where exactly is the proposed areas for beavers in the Sienega? So do we... I don't know if you can pull that up on a map, Lisa, or... Oh, not my super good skill set. <laughs> well, I, I did look, I uh, was talking with uh, Marcus and I, I looked on Google um, Earth and it was south of Highway 10 and uh, north of Highway 83. So if you're in Sonoida and you found the creek and went north towards I-10. It's about halfway between Sonoida and I-10. Awesome, thanks Mike. Um, and so we have a question from Diana. Um, what do you think the impact of the border wall on the San Pedro beaver populations will be? The gates in the wall at the international boundary are huge and difficult to open quickly and at present time, um, our spot welded closed uh, with only four to six inches open um, spaces between the bollards. Is there enough room, do you all think, for uh, cross-border migration? Um, and how do you think those will affect uh, the beaver populations? Well, that's, that's interesting. I was just up there the other day and maybe you were there, there Diana, and it, uh, those doors looked like they'd be extremely hard to open. Um, they do have other doors where you can come in from the side and clean away debris, but if you get a flash flood coming through there, you're going to get a whole bunch of debris piled up. And, you know, I could see that coming down at some point. I wouldn't be surprised if 10 years from now we hear that the wall has collapsed right at the river. But, you know, that's an interesting question about beaver. Um, I've seen javelina get through some pretty narrow spaces, so I wonder if beaver could get through that those gaps. Would you say it was like six six inches or so? Mm -hmm. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if many beaver could, but you know some beaver are pretty big. So I, I would think that the bigger beaver couldn't get through. Um, yeah, that's a real good question. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I think it would definitely have some kind of impact. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and we've got another question for for you, Mike. Um, what? Uh, an estimated feet, and where is the deepest trenches of the San Pedro that you have personally seen? The deepest um, part of the San Pedro? Mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> when we walk through it, I'll sometimes get up to about my waist. Um, every once in a while you can find a spot that's a little bit deeper than that, but generally not over your waist. And um, another thing people have asked me about is, quicksand and what happens is when you get a flood you'll um, it'll build up a lot of alluvial soil which is real loose and you have the alluvial soil that's thoroughly wet you'll sink in and the deepest I've ever sunk into alluvial soil was about up, about up to my waist not, not quite up to my waist uh, but it's never really been an issue and it's usually so wet that you can get out 
when we did the survey this year, I didn't find any quicksand anywhere. And I would, I hate to call it quicksand, but, um, but yeah, there, um, in a few of those stretches, it does get uh, about up to your waist. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think there were there were some points where um, in Steve's group, which is um, Steve led the group that I did the survey with, um, we also had one of our volunteers, his name was Mike, and he is also pretty tall. I think he's, I think he's over six feet. I don't remember, but he, I think, was wading in at about his waist or above at some points. He wanted to walk through the river the, almost the whole way. So um, that was, that was really cool to see. Um, Lots of, lots of water. Um, so um, you all can definitely keep putting your questions in the chat. I've also allowed you all to unmute um, so you can raise your hand or turn on your video or uh, there's a little icon if you would like to unmute and ask your question um, to us, you are welcome to do that as well. Uh, well, you know, mostly uh, it's very pleasant walking through the river. It's usually only about a foot deep. And uh, when you have a warm day, our, was, our, our day uh, wasn't all that warm, but um, mm -hmm. when it's warm, it's, it's just a total blast. <laughs> Mike, I have a question. Wondering um, from your experience, what is the perception of the local community of the beavers in general, like Sierra Vista, Bisbee area? Well, it doesn't impact, impact people like it does in Wisconsin, you know, where a beaver will flood a road or flood somebody's property. So there isn't the same hatred for beaver that you find in other parts of the country. There's that one unfortunate gentleman that, you know, blames everything on the beaver. Um, but for the most part, I think uh, people are just kind of curious uh, in the schools. I worked in the service to schools for 28 years, and there's a lot of curiosity. People are very interested in it. And I think people liked the beaver. They didn't have any negative um, consequences from the beaver being around. And they thought it was interesting that, you know, this, you know, aquatic creature was in this desert environment. So I think generally people um, uh, like the idea. Uh, initially, when they were letting them go, a lot of people, as we talked about earlier, were really concerned about cutting down the beautiful trees, you know, as I was. And... Uh, as Steve was saying, uh, the one guy who owns the property is putting fences around some of his favorite trees. Uh, so, you know, that's an issue. But for, but for, me, for me, I just kind of saw things even, evening out when they, when they would fell a tree at, um, you know, the, eventually, you know, they, they'd build a dam and organic material would pile up and new trees would appear in other places. And this year, an interesting phenomenon happened because we didn't have any scouring floods. And so there's huge cottonwood recruitment all along the river. Like if you get into the river now, you'll find little saplings about this high all over. And in the uh, fall, it was beautiful because you look at the bed of the river and there'd be this nice little golden cast all along uh, the bed of the river in places. Awesome. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Lisa and Steve, even though he's not here anymore. Um, if there are no more questions, um, thank you all for coming tonight as well. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Uh, this was just really informative and um, had a lot of fun doing the survey. And I hope all of you, um, or at least some of you, would be able to join us um, this next um, survey time in um, probably about December, November time. So keep the keep a lookout for um, those different events and other volunteer opportunities through the River and Network program as well.